Uh, so thanks everybody for coming and, and uh, joining our webinar this morning. Uh, we're going to be talking about a couple different things. Uh, my name is Ryan Leiterman. Uh, I will be the host uh, for today. And I'm going to be talking about practical disinfection techniques. I think it's kind of a timely topic, uh, given the high path avian influenza that's been found in Wisconsin. Then Alex Austin is a livestock nutritionist with Crystal Creek. She is going to be talking about poultry nutrition and eggshell quality and how those two are tied together. Uh, she's also going to be talking, ending the session with a fun uh, little presentation about different poultry breeds and selecting the right poultry breed for you. Uh, Cassie Goldberg is a livestock specialist with us. She's going to be acting as today's moderator. So maybe I'll have uh, Alex and Cassie introduce themselves. Alex, why don't you go first? Sure. So I'm Alex Austin. As Ryan said, I'm a livestock nutritionist here. Um, yep, I'm going to be covering yep, nutrition and poultry breeds. Um, so two presentations for me. Um, I have had poultry all my life. My grandma kind of got me started with chickens. So I had chickens growing up and I currently have some of my own along with uh, three call ducks. So that's kind of my poultry background. Okay, hi, I'm Cassie Goldberg. I'm a livestock specialist. Um, what, seven months here now at Crystal Creek? So that's pretty awesome. Um, I'm gonna be moderating. So if you have any questions, you can type them in the chat and I'll make sure that Ryan and Alex get them. Um, yeah, I, I've had poultry, not at the moment, but so yeah, that's about me. Okay, so uh, today's, today's webinar is going to be a little different. In the past, we've done longer, more in-depth presentations, uh, typically like 30 to 45 minutes, uh, where we really explore the details of certain topics and dissect stuff out. We decided for this year's webinar that we're going to do something a little different, and we're going to do multiple shorter presentations uh, with the goal of anywhere from like 10 to 20 minutes per presentation. As we're going, if you have questions, feel free to type them in, and Cassie will make sure that we get those answered. Uh, at the end of the presentation. So uh, I'm gonna get started here. Let me just see. I think I have to hand the screen over to Alex. So Alex, Alex is gonna start talking about poultry nutrition and its impact on eggshell quality. So let me hand this off to Alex. All right, so can everybody see my screen? Okay. All right, so my topic, uh, the first one for the Crystal Creek Poultry Webinar is gonna be on nutrition and egg shell quality. So the first part, um, we're gonna break it down into understanding bioavailability, then we'll touch on some layer requirements, and then we'll use those two topics and kind of sum it up into how you can apply it to reading a feed tag. So to get started, um, bioavailability, what is it and why is it important? So the definition of bioavailability is um, the portion of a substance which enters circulation when introduced into the body and so is able to have an active effect. So to make it simple, let's say you can you eat something that has 100 part per million zinc. Um, you eat that and the form that the zinc comes in is not that bioavailable. So you actually are able to only absorb 50 part per million. So knowing the bioavailability and the form of the mineral and the nutrition um, is important because how it, how it impacts um, the health and production of, you know, in this situation, we're talking about layers. So their overall health and egg laying um, also um, meeting requirements and then breaking it down um, into cost. So if it's more usable, there's a lot less waste and it is more bang for your buck basically. So to show you how this kind of works, this is a nice visual. Um, so the example we're going to use today is zinc. So there's different forms that minerals can come in. Um, they can come in zinc sulfates, zinc oxides, 
or what Crystal Creek uses is um, polysaccharide chelates. So in this first picture on the left, you can see the zinc sulfate as it's going through the digestive tract. The body has to actually separate the zinc from the sulfate, and then the zinc molecule has to then be um, bound to either an amino acid or a carb. In this example, it's um, the body binds it to a sugar, and then it is able to be absorbed. Um, then that free sulfate can actually as it's going through the body, bind up other minerals and even vitamins, preventing those from being absorbed. So it's kind of a long process to get from the zinc sulfate into an absorbable form. Now, if you have a more bioavailable form, such as a polysaccharide chelate, it is already ready to absorb. The body does not have to break it down or separate it and then connect it to a protein or a carb. It's already connected. So, um, a polysaccharide chelate, so um, that is a carb, and then chelated means um, a mineral is attached to an organic compound, like I said, in this situation, um, it's a carb for what we have. So the different um, options that are out on the market that you'll see, so like I said, the polysaccharide chelate, that's what we have, is 90 plus percent available. Um, amino acid, chelates, also a good bioavailable form, proteinates, and then it kind of breaks down into sulfates and oxide, which are, have a lot lower bioavailability um, versus a chelate. Another important nutrient to look at when evaluating um, quality would be selenium. Uh, so the form that we use would be selenium yeast. Um, another common form you might see on the market would be sodium selenite. As you can see on the graph, the selenium yeast has much more bioavailability, is much more readily absorbed by the body versus a sodium selenite. And selenium is an important one to look at because in the feed industry, we're limited on how much we can include into a mineral or feed. So making sure that the form that we're using is very bioavailable is important. So now we'll kind of look at the requirements. So on large operations where they have hundreds of birds, a lot of times they'll actually break down the diets into different phases. So the phases are based on age um, and then the producer is better able to target the different nutrient requirements at that age. Um, it is more cost effective and uh, better for the birds. You can easily target that. Um, for our smaller backyard producers, a lot of times we have a wide range of age. We can have some older birds that are four or five years old, and then we'll a lot of times have some pullets that are just starting to come into lay. So when formulating a chicken feed, a layer feed, um, you have to take all these requirements into consideration. So for example, when we're formulating, we wanna make sure that we're meeting the um, lysine and methionine that a young bird will need by also, and also meeting the calcium requirement that is higher for an older bird. And you can see that in this table. So you kind of shoot for the middle, daily requirements for phase three, which you know, um, as you saw in the previous slide, it was a 16 and a half percent. And then on our family flock layer, which um, can be fed to all backyard poultry um, for layers, you can see that the lysine and methionine um, provided by our layer feed is higher and meets the requirements and also um, goes a little above and beyond for those younger birds that have higher requirements. And then the calcium is at a 4.25, which is meeting the calcium requirements of older birds. And then also the phosphorus is a little higher meeting the needs. So how can you apply the bioavailability topic and minerals to reading a feed tag? Um, so, to give you an example, so the family flock layer ration that we have here at Crystal Creek, 
So if you look at the tag, it'll list the different minerals that are in the feed. So as you can see, um, we have manganese, polysaccharide complex, um, same with the zinc, we have the copper proteinate, and then we have selenium yeast as well. Now, if you go to say Farm and Fleet and look at a tag there of one of the layers that they might have on the shelf, in this example, I'm gonna use Laina crumbles. Um, they have zinc oxide, copper sulfate, and then the sodium selenite. So these forms are lower in bioavailability. So what is provided, the bird is only most likely gonna be able to absorb around 50% of that, give or take. Um, and then also same with the sodium selenite. Something you might see on other tags is they will use, um, say, a lower, lower quality, lower bioavailability form, such as the zinc oxide. And then you will also see a zinc chelate that's um, kind of dressing up the, the feed tag. So you can say that they're providing a higher quality, more bioavailable source, but more than likely the majority of say the zinc is coming from the cheaper source such as zinc oxide or zinc sulfate. So now we're gonna lead into the next topic, um, which is eggshell quality. So um, shell quality can be an indicator of health and or nutrition issues. Um, most, most shell um, problems are caused by diet, stress, um, changes in lighting. So there can be a few different causes. So we're gonna go into some of the more common um, eggshell issues that you might see on your operation. So soft, thin, shellless eggs. So some of you may have seen this on your, um, in your backyard flock. So it's either you know a shell that's easy to crack, very thin, or almost rubbery and kind of collapses in when you poke it, as you can see in the picture. Um, so this can be caused by nutrition, so low phosphorus or calcium, salt water, uh, mycotoxins, stress on the birds, such as you know um, a thunderstorm or a dog chasing them anything that could cause stress to them. Um, bird age, this is more common in older hens, um, immature shell glands, egg drop syndrome. Egg drop syndrome is seen, so if you have a backyard flock where you have chickens and ducks that co-mingle, um, this is actually a virus that waterfowl duck, ducks carry and that can be passed on to chickens. So if you see this in your chickens, when you have ducks, um, this could be a cause and it will usually last four to 10 weeks, um, depending. Um, so that is you know, something that can happen. Um, also diseases such as avian influenza or infectious bronchitis. Um, I know Ryan is going to touch on the avian influenza, um, but I know that's kind of a hot topic. So um, basically you can see if they have the avian influenza, you can see soft shells, but sudden death, low energy, low appetite, um, purple or discolored swollen combs, diarrhea, nasal just discharge, coughing, sneezing, low production or misshapen eggs are also signs of the avian influenza. Um, another one, calcium deposits. Uh, coated egg. So you can see in the picture kind of the different color variation on the egg. Um, so this is caused by defective shell gland, stress during calcification, or excess calcium in the diet. So if while the egg shell is being made, um, you know, it's very hot or there's overcrowding or like as I said on the previous slide, a thunderstorm, basically anything that could stress out your chicken during the process could cause this. Pimpled eggs, similar to the previous one, um, stress during calcification, excess calcium in the diet, or else a younger or older chicken. You can see this in, you can kind of see in the picture where it's almost like a sandpaper or there's extra texture to the egg. Cracked or mended eggs. 
Um, so this one, you can kind of see it's almost like a belt around the egg or a crack in the egg that was healed over or um, calcium was added over to close up the egg. So abrupt changes in lighting can cause this. So for example, in the winter, um, if you decide to add supplemental lighting to your chickens and that, you know, that would be an abrupt change. Um, you may decide to do that to encourage laying, but then you may see some eggs like this in the beginning. Overcrowding, stress during calcific calcification, and older chickens. So causes um, for blood on eggs would be overweight chickens, pecking or bullying, pullets coming into lay, so again, sudden changes in light and poor hygiene. Another one that you might see, and this one I feel is, is common, um, you can kind of see the texture on the bottom of the egg, so a wrinkled egg, um, stress, infectious bronchitis, or a defective shell gland are all possible causes for this. So if you are seeing these in your flock, um, you should consider the cause. So evaluating the age of your birds, do you have, um, if you recently started seeing some issues, do you have a lot of pullets coming into lay or do you have a lot of older hens in your flock? Um, evaluate the nutrition. So are the calcium requirements being met um, as well as you know, other minerals? Um, macro and micro. Um, lighting, so time of year, are we going in, are we just starting to come into spring so the days are getting longer and your chickens are just starting to come into lay again? Or have you decided in the winter to add supplemental lighting, which would be an abrupt change? Um, stress, so basically any stress can cause um, some changes in your eggshells. So heat is a big one, especially in you know, the hot months such as July. Um, overcrowding would be another common one um, or basically anything like rough handling, um, say a dog was chasing them um, or a thunderstorm. So anything that could really stress them out. So that's the end of the first presentation. So are there any questions? So we have a couple questions, Alex. Um, so besides eggshell, what else um, could indicate poor nutrition? Yeah, that's a good question. Okay, so um, when looking at your chickens, you know, we already touched on eggshells, that's a good indicator, but just looking at your bird's overall coat, um, their feather, well, I should say feathers, not coat, but um, so the feather quality, their combs, um, also their manure as well. Um, and if you are concerned about anything like that, you can always, you know, look at your feed tag or, you know, we're available here at Crystal Creek to help you look at your current nutrition and answer any questions and evaluate it. Okay. Um, what age do chickens start and stop laying? So chickens are usually going to start laying around 18 weeks of age. Um, it's usually when they, you know, pull it, start coming into lay. And then as the bird ages, their percent production de just decreases every year. <clears throat> so their first year, they're probably going to be around 100%, you know, close to 100%, 90% production. The following year, it's going to drop down to, say, 80 um, and then just go down and birds do live, can live a long time if taken care of and they can live, you know, six, seven years. Um, once they get that old, they're probably not going to lay very much, if at all, but their, their production is going to probably be closer to, you know, 20 to 30 percent at that older age. Um, and that being said, you know, it's not 100 percent, so you're not going to see like 365 eggs a year. It's going to be 100 percent of their potential production. So that you should evaluate the breed because every breed has different potential. Um, 
some breeds have, you know, 250 eggs average year, some can do 300, some are more like 150. So that's something that should be evaluated when looking at um, selecting your layer breeds. Okay. Um, you mentioned chickens that just started laying and chickens that reached the end of their laying cycle. Uh, how can I tell when that is? So, like, how do you know when your chickens are starting to lay? Is that? Yeah. So I would just look at the age of the bird. Do you have, you know, some chickens, are they reaching that 18 weeks of age? Um, then you're probably, as they start coming into lay, they are gonna have probably some goofy looking eggs. A lot of times they'll have pullets come into lay, they have smaller eggs. Um, as we talked about, you know, maybe some, you know, different things going on with the calcium gland um, and just misshapen eggs. So your young pullets, you can see different things like that. Your older ones, you're probably gonna see a, like just a big decrease in production. So just kind of looking at the age range of your flock. Okay, great. Um, so I think that's um, all the questions we have so far for this one. If you have any other questions too, we can answer some more at the end too, but I think we'll turn it over to Ryan at this point for some your presentation. All right, thanks, Cassie. Let me just pull this up here. Okay, can everybody see that okay? All right, so um, just a little quick side story. Disinfection has been a long-standing passion of mine. Uh, when I went to veterinary school, we learned some very uh, complicated, complex, highly effective disinfection techniques. And when I graduated veterinary school, I went out into the real world uh, full of uh, energy and vigor to share these very complicated but yet effective disinfection techniques with people and found that... Um, no one did them because they were too hard. And so the most effective disinfection technique that never gets done has 0% effectiveness. And so for the last 13 years, I've been kind of on this kick to try to make things easy for people. Um, we work with a lot of farmers and, and anybody who farms knows that it's not like they have a lot of time on their hands. So uh, what I want to share with you guys today is not some ivory tower, big university protocol. I just want to share some easy tips and tricks that you guys can use for disinfection for your backyard poultry operations. So let's see here. Oh no, how do I? We're having technical difficulties here. I can't advance my slideshow. Okay, I'm gonna have to call for help. Uh, somebody come please help me. I can do surgery on animals and I can't seem to run my computer. So. Um, <clears throat> We have some help here that's going to help me. I'll do it now. There we go. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, we're back in business. Uh, so if we talk about why do we need disinfection on farms, uh, we just look at all the different biosecurity threats that we have uh, for our animals. We have people coming to visit. We have new birds coming in. We have, uh, you know, feed coming into the farm on larger farms with trucks that might have been on other farms previous to that. Uh, there's plenty of opportunity for pathogens, bacteria, viruses, parasites to come onto uh, our farm and infect our animals. And so how can we prevent against that? Well, the number one way is through good sanitation and biosecurity measures. Okay, so if you want to know about bacteria on the farm, we have to know about a biofilm. Now, biofilm is the scientific word, words that people might be a little more familiar with would be like scuzz, gross stuff. It's the stuff that if you have a uh, water and you scrape your fingernail down it and you get junk underneath your fingernail, that's, that's the biofilm. Okay, we call it scuzz, it's gross. Uh, you might not know it, but 90% of the bacteria on a farm live in this biofilm matrix. Okay, and so the way that, they're, the way that a biofilm grows is that some bacteria will seed onto a surface. It might be a surface of a feeder, a water inside the chicken coop, whatever the surface is. And that, that phase is called attachment. The next phase is called growth. So th those bacteria, once they attach to the surface, will start to grow and multiply. As time goes on, they become more mature. Throughout the maturation process, 
they start to secrete uh, sticky things, proteins, and they make a little matrix and they live in that matrix. Now, uh, I'm 40, so if you're like 20 years old, you might not be able to relate to this, but my grandma used to make this jello where she would like cut up bananas or mandarin oranges and put them in the jello and then like form it and they would be they would be like stuck in the jello matrix okay that's how you can think about a biofilm the bacteria would be the mandarin oranges or the or the uh the little banana slices and the biofilm would be that jello matrix that they live in and they do that to protect themselves so they don't dry out so that chemical disinfectants don't penetrate the biofilm and kill them it's like a defense mechanism uh, after that biofilm is, has grown and matured, it'll go to detachment where they'll actually slough bacteria back off into the environment where they can float around, find another surface to attach and start this whole process over. So the key thing to understand is if we really want to have a clean facility and we want to try to keep our disinfection protocols uh, as effective as possible, we have to address the biofilm because that is the single biggest source of bacteria and viruses on any farm that there is. So how are we gonna do that? There's a lot of different disinfectants out there. Uh, and by far, uh, the research shows the most effective disinfectant is a product called chlorine dioxide. Uh, the word chlorine, you might think of bleach. It would be like a chemical cousin of bleach or like bleach on steroids would be another way to think about it. So chlorine dioxide is actually a gas, okay? So that'll become important later. And what we do is we mix, uh, we mix this up, our, our solution, uh, and we mix it up and the chlorine dioxide molecule actually gets attached to a water molecule and we use that to do our disinfection. Uh, it's extremely effective and has some of the hot, not some of it, has the highest kill rates uh, of any disinfectant on the market. And the cool part is it has no harmful residues. And, and um, because it is suspended in the water and it exists as a gas, if we were to spray a chlorine dioxide solution, onto something that we want to disinfect, um, when that solution dries and all the water evaporates off, all the chlorine dioxide that would have been trapped in those water molecules that were killing bacteria have gassed off into the environment and there is zero chemical residue left on whatever that is, water, feeder, chicken coop, whatever surface we're disinfecting. Um, because it is a gas, you want to use it in well-ventilated areas. It's no problem if you use it outside. And if you're doing like a chicken coop or something, just to keep the, the doors open or the windows open, until it airs out. So uh, now this is some, some research done on killing Cryptosporidium parvum. Cryptosporidium is a single cell parasite. Uh, and the reason we use this as a test for disinfection, uh, disinfection agents is it's one of the hardest things that there is to kill. Bacteria are relatively easy to kill. Viruses are relatively easy to kill. Cryptosporidium as a single cell parasite is an extremely tough little devil to kill. And if we can kill that, then that disinfection agent is effective in pretty much everything. And you'll see here highlighted on the screen, chlorine dioxide at 100 part per million can kill Cryptosporidium with less than one minute of contact time. Um, compare that to something like sodium hypochlorite, that would be 6% bleach. Uh, you could leave it on there on that cryptosporidium for days and it would not kill it. Um, so a pretty, pretty interesting uh, effect there, but highly, highly effective at disinfection. So the way you make it is really simple. We have these little uh, 20 gram tablets here. It's in a little foil pack and you tear it open. It kind of reminds me of an Alka-Seltzer and you put this into one gallon of water and that's going to make a concentration uh, concentrate for you. Now, people ask me how long does it last. Now, this is a little, this is a little one gallon. Hang on, what do I have to do? Here? Sorry, more technical help here. Okay, am I bigger now? Now I'm bigger on the screen. Okay, so this is a one gallon container that, as an experiment, I made uh, 500 part per million concentrate of chlorine dioxide back in 2017, okay? Now I've kept it in the fridge. Uh, you wanna keep it cool, you wanna keep it out of direct sunlight and you wanna keep it tightly sealed so it's in this container. Now since 2017, some of the effectiveness has gone away over time, but I tested it this morning and this is still uh, mostly potent. Um, 
we're still over 100 part per million here. So uh, the chlorine dioxide, if you keep it sealed uh, and in a cool spot, uh, your concentrate can last a long time. Uh, so I, I don't know how many more years I have until this uh, loses effectiveness, but it's just kind of like a little side hobby of mine that I just see how long this stuff stays good for. So 2017, we're still good. Okay, I'm gonna go back to my presentation here. Okay, so now if you want to make that concentrate, it's really simple. You take this one tablet, you put it in a gallon of water, and then when you're not using it, you keep it sealed. If you have a beer fridge in your garage, that would be a great place to put it when you're not using it. Keeps it out of sunlight, keeps it cool, keep the cap on it. Stuff will stay good for a long time. When you make that one gallon of concentrate, it's going to be 525 parts per million. That's going to be extremely strong, extremely potent. And you certainly don't need to use it at that concentration. So what we do then is that's kind of, it just stays there in storage until you need it. When you want to actually disinfect something, uh, it depends on the concentration you want to use. Most people are using between 50 and 100 part per million. So you would take your concentrate that you made and you would just dilute that down. And the way you dilute it down is you'd use about three cups of concentrate for one gallon of water would give you 100 part per million and one and a half cups of concentrate per gallon of water would give you about 50 part per million. And then you can just go about uh, spraying and disinfecting however you want, uh, whatever items you want on the farm. So the practical uh, uses, again here, I don't know how to change this screen. Could you please help me? Um, the practical now for the show and tell tools that I really like. Uh, again, easy. Just go to Menards, you get one of these like one gallon pump sprayers. You put in your one and a half to three cups of concentrate, fill this up, pump around, and then you just walk around just killing bacteria everywhere. Just, just getting whatever you want. Coops, uh, you know, feeding equipment, boots, whatever you want. Uh, super easy way to do it. Now, because the chlorine dioxide will, using it as a gas, it will gas off over time. If you leave it in this unsealed container, uh, it will probably only remain effective for a week until the concentration of chlorine dioxide will go down. So if you're going to mix it in this pump sprayer, I would recommend using it uh, within a week. And if you don't, dump it out and remix so that it stays good. Okay. Okay, so uh, the other thing is that would be like your daily use if you want to use the chlorine dioxide for cleaning stuff. Uh, if you were going to do an annual or semi-annual deep clean, uh, there's another product that you'll want to use and it's called chlorofoam. It comes in a gallon and it's a, it's a chlorinated alkaline detergent and its primary job is one of the strongest biofilm busters that there is on the market. The chlorinated alkaline detergent chemically digests the biofilm, while it's still safe for plastics and metals, wood, stuff like that, uh, it, is, it is digesting the biofilm that breaks apart that matrix, kills some of the bacteria, but mainly what we're doing is opening up that biofilm matrix and allowing our chlorine dioxide disinfectant to then become even more effective because we've busted up that biofilm matrix. So again, some of the handy tools uh, that you could use to do this would be this guy, one of my personal favorites, it's a foaming gun. So what I do is I just take all my feeding equipment, anything that I want to deep clean, I lay it out on the ground or like on the concrete apron of the garage. And you take this foam, it comes in a one gallon. This is a ready to use. And you just dump it in like that into the well of the foaming gun. And then you just hook this up to a garden hose and you just go to town foaming stuff. And the, and the stuff will come out of the end here, all foamy and white. And you just soak everything. Uh, in that detergent, you foam it down, 10 minutes of contact time, uh, and then we can rinse it off. Uh, this one is kind of nice because you foam, 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 and then when you're done foaming, you can just disconnect this, and now you have just clean water from your garden hose, and you can spray everything off. You rinse the chlorinated alkaline detergent off, and then you come back with your chlorine dioxide in this handy little spray pump, and you are done.
this one. Okay. So if you're gonna do a cleaning protocol, uh, when I was in vet school, the, the gentleman that taught us disinfection uh, had one big rule and he said, you cannot disinfect filth. Meaning that if we put disinfectant on a wall where there's a bunch of manure spread across it, uh, we need to get the what he calls the gross stuff. Gross means big, the gross soil out. So clean the bedding out, scrape any manure off the walls, get all the organic material out of whatever we're gonna clean whether that's the um, waterers, the feeders, the coop, get all the organic material cleaned out. That's the first thing. Then foam it down good with the chloroform, the foaming detergent, let that foam sit and digest and chemically break up that biofilm for 10 to 15 minutes. Rinse that off and then apply your chlorine dioxide solution and let it air dry. Pretty simple. Um, just going to touch base. I know that there's been some questions about avian influenza. Wisconsin has had high pathogenic avian influenza found in southern Wisconsin. Uh, if I could just implore people, don't get your information off of Facebook. Go to a trusted information source. My source of choice and many veterinarians is DATCAP. DATCAP is a Department for Animal Trade Consumer Protection. I've got a link on there and they are a wonderful source of fact-based information regarding even influenza. Um, so this is some information that I pulled off their website. Uh, currently, uh, up, up until uh, April 7th, there was uh, 204 poultry in a non-commercial poultry operation that were found infected and depopulated. Depopulation is the only way that this um, is controlled once it's found on a site. So uh, as you're looking, signs of avian influenza, just a couple things. Now, the problem is poultry are a prey species, so a lot of diseases all look the same anyways. Um, but decreased food consumption, respiratory signs such as coughing, sneezing, uh, swollen waddles, uh, those kind of things are signs that could potentially be high path avian influenza. Also, if you see that, don't freak out. It could be a million other diseases too. Um, but if you do see something like this, it probably is best to con contact your local veterinarian um, some of those animals may have to be tested to see. Uh, prevention, and this isn't just preventing high path, path avian influenza. This is really just general good biosecurity for any poultry operation, backyard poultry or, or massive commercial poultry operation, is restricting access to your property. So actually, when you look at the statistics, a lot of high path avian influenza is found in backyard poultry. And the reason is, Generally speaking, people are much more relaxed about their biosecurity program. They play with their chickens, their kids play with their chickens, they go to the neighbors and play with the chickens, and they take their chicken to a fair. Uh, the whole time, there's very minimal biosecurity, and generally those uh, diseases can be spread very rapidly in that kind of situation. So um, limiting access to your chickens, uh, is, especially with other people who have small flocks, uh, is probably one of the biggest biosecurity things you can do. Uh, clean and disinfect often. It's easy. We have the tools to make it easy, so um, so it's easy to do. Uh, keep new birds separate from your flock for 30 days. That that biosecurity idea of a quarantine is pretty normal. Don't share equipment with your neighbor. Um, wash hands before and after bird handling. It is possible to have avian influenza contracted to humans, although that's very rare. Uh, and source chicks from certified USAI clean hatcheries. So I'll just give an example here. This is a report that we got from one of our hatcheries here, and it comes, they're part of the National Poultry Improvement Program. Uh, I believe it's important to only source chicks from hatcheries that are part of that. They have to undergo very rigorous testing. They're monitored for salmonella, they're monitored for high path avian influenza, they're monitored for a lot of infectious diseases. And when their birds, their chicks are sent out, you get a form saying, that they are current on all their uh, monitoring and that they are negative. And so I think that's a really important thing as well. So thanks for coming. Um, Alex has got another presentation, kind of a fun one on poultry breeds. Uh, but if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. So um, is chlorine dioxide effective against avian influenza? Yes, it is. So uh, it's highly effective against all viruses and actually in the spectrum of kill, uh, parasites are the hardest, bacteria are the second hardest, and viruses are actually the easiest to kill. Um, and chlorine dioxide is highly effective against that. 
Right. Are there any adverse health effects from chlorine dioxide um, as a disinfectant? Yeah, so chlorine dioxide being that it's a gas, um, when you mix it in really high concentrations, you don't wanna just sit around and like smell that. You don't wanna just grab your bottle and be like, you know, it, it can act as a respiratory irritant. And so as long as you're using it uh, in lower concentrations and well-ventilated areas, there's absolutely no problems. If it was ever to be used in high concentrated uh, quantities with poorly ventilated areas, it can act as a respiratory irritant. It's not any, there's no carcinogenic properties or anything like that, but it, it's no different than using uh, chlorine in too concentrated of a form uh, where it could have some irritation in the respiratory tract. But that's it. Okay, great. I think that's all the questions so far. So, okay. Alex, I think you're up. Okay. All right. I will just get my PowerPoint pulled up. Okay, all right, so this last topic is kind of a fun one. I'm choosing the right chicken for you. So there's lots of different breeds out there. Um, so we're gonna I'm gonna try to touch on some of the more common ones um, and just look at what are some potential um, purposes that people are looking for and the breeds that we'd recommend. Um, so looking at meat birds, egg layers, or multi-purpose, and then we'll take a look at mixing up your flock, and then some higher maintenance breeds. So meat chickens, um, most commonly known are the Cornish Cross. Those are the white broilers. Um, a lot of commercial uh, producers will use this breed as well as backyard producers. Um, you might see some people raising a thousand a year or somebody raising 15 a year for their family. Um, these guys are very popular because they will reach um, processing weight, um, seven plus pounds in eight weeks of age. So they grow very fast, gain very well, and produce a lot of meat. Another breed that is gaining in popularity, um, the Red Ranger. Um, also called Red Ranger, Husky Red. So these guys are gaining in popularity because some, um, some of our backyard producers want a meat bird that is a little more active and forages around a little more. And these guys will do that. Um, the Cornish Cross kind of like to just go up to, go up to their feeder, plop down and just eat. Where the Red Ranger, they'll kind of run around, forage for bugs, things like that. Um, they are, a little slower growing and a little smaller. So um, they're gonna be around more like six pounds, um, reaching six pounds by about 10 weeks of age. So a little smaller, a little slower growing, but depending on what you're looking to do, um, they might be a good fit for you. So some other breeds that you could use for meat um, could be the Buff Orpington, Jersey Giant, Wine Dots, Rhode Island Reds. Uh, I selected these ones to kind of talk about just because that they do reach um, a mature weight that is fairly large. So um, decent meat on these birds, but because they are not bred for meat, such as the Red Rangers or the Cornish Cross, it takes them uh, quite a bit longer to reach this mature weight. Um, these breeds can also be used for laying as well. So if you haven't had chickens before, but you are looking for laying hens, but not sure how to basically um, take the first step or what breed would be a good start, um, you probably, you're probably you gonna want something that's easy to handle and gonna lay very well, um, averaging you know 300 eggs per year. Um, this breed would be the Isa Brown or the Golden Comet would be what I would recommend. They're very good temperament, and like I said, they're going to be around 300 eggs per year. So they're very easy chickens um, to get started with. Um, like I said, good personalities and good layers. 
So if you already have chickens and you're looking to add some variety, um, one option could be looking at different breeds that add egg color variety. So the Morans, um, they are gonna lay a very dark chocolate colored egg. Easter Eggers, um, other people call them rainbow eggers, you may have seen Americanas. Um, they're going to, depending on the bird, going to lay either a blue, green, or pink colored egg. The barred rock, they lay a nice light brown to pink colored egg. <clears throat> and then the well summers are known for laying a darker brown egg with a higher chance of getting the speckling on the eggshell. If you're looking to add more color um, or just some different looking birds to your flock, uh, Polish varieties are good. They have the, as you can see in the bottom right corner, there's a picture of a Polish chicken. <clears throat> they have the crest on the top of their head. Their feathers will point back and they get a nice puff on their head, so kind of unique looking there. Um, Spitzhauben. Those birds have a crest on the top of their neck, um, but unlike the Polish, their feathers actually um, on their crest will point forward instead of back. <clears throat> they are black and white, a little smaller body frame. So a little unique looking. Um, turkins, so that would be the picture in the top right. These birds do not have, they're large breed um, and they do not have feathers on their neck, just on the top of their head and body. Wine dots, they are a very popular breed. Um, they have very pretty feathers. Um, for example, the golden lace wine dot have kind of a gold feather um, with black with black lace around each feather. So kind of so feathers that have two colors on them. So very pretty. Um, and then the lavender orpingtons, which is the picture right there in the middle, um, they have kind of a smoky gray colored feather. So there's lots of other unique looking breeds out there too. Um, these are just ones that I selected that I thought were kind of unique. And then if you're, uh, as you're looking through the different breeds that are available, some higher maintenance ones could be silkies, banties, and feather-legged breeds. So these guys could, may require a little extra care and attention. So silkies, um, they're in the bottom right-hand corner. Their feathers are kind of like down. They're very fluffy. Um, they have very good personalities. They're kind of known as the teddy bear chicken. Um, I would say these guys are a little more higher maintenance just because um, they, if their feathers get wet, they are more prone to getting chilled. Um, with other chickens, the, their feathers will repel water where these guys, they don't repel water as well. Um, also, with the feathers on their legs, that can cause some issues, um, potentially. Bantams are the small breed kind of mini chickens. There's different varieties out there. Um, if you have larger chickens mixed in your flock and you have banties, you just have to make sure that you have enough room, um, so not overcrowding, to make sure that these guys aren't getting picked on because they are smaller, so they're an easy target. <clears throat> Also, there are some that are more prone to being cold, um, so they don't do as well in the northern climate. So if you do have some smaller breeds that are not as cold hardy, providing some supplemental heat in your coop during the winter might be necessary. And then feather-legged breeds. Um, these guys will have feathers down the side of their legs and onto their feet. Um, these guys can maybe require a little extra attention just because their feathers on their feet, um, if it's muddy, they can get matted down and kind of gross. So there may need, may need to be some care taken there. And that's the same with the silkies as well. They have the feathers down their legs and on their feet. Um, in the winter, uh, if the snow is kind of slushy um, and pack and will pack easy, they can get it built up on their feet and feathers. So just keeping an eye on that. And then also with the feather leg breeds, they are a little more prone to having leg mite issues. So just keeping an eye on their legs and making sure that they're not having in, any issues with that. So, all right. 
Well, that kind of wraps things up. Um, so any questions on that? So how much space uh, would you recommend that a chicken has? So it's recommended that per bird, you should provide about 10 square feet of run. So, and then if, you, if you're able to provide more, that's great. So the more the better, but at least doing 10 feet squared per chicken. Great. And are there any breeds, what breeds do you think don't do well in a cold climate? So some breeds that I think, as I kind of touched on, would be the feather-legged breeds, just because of the potential of snow buildup. Um, they can be, they can be very cold hardy, but just monitoring their feet to make sure snow is not getting built up. <clears throat> and then banties, uh, as I touched on, just making sure that uh, you have a variety that does well in the cold. If not, you may need to add supplemental heat to your coop. Um, silkies and frizzles. I didn't talk about frizzles, but they have, their feathers will actually curl. Um, but like the silkies, they don't repel water when they get wet. So just making sure that they're not getting wet and chilled. And then also any breeds that have a large comb, such as the Rhode Island Reds or Andalusians, they can be prone to frostbite. So if you do have breeds like that, just making sure you're monitoring them and uh, adding heat to your coop if needed. Okay, great. And then to wrap this up, um, can you talk a little bit about how um, people could order chicks, where they can order them, how we go about it? Yeah, so at Crystal Creek, we do sell chicks. So we have um, quite a variety, actually. Um, we source chicks through two hatcheries. Uh, Sunnyside Hatchery and Avondroth Hatchery, and they're both um, certified, you know, um, you know, test for avian influenza. So Dr. Ryan talked about that before. Um, they also source their birds from reputable breeders. So, um, and they provide a wide range of uh, breeds. So from, you know, meat chickens to banties to silkies to Rhode Island Reds, um, even some more unique breeds like guineas, pheasants, different types of ducks, so. Great, and can people order feed through us? Yes, yeah. so we offer um, a line called Family Flock, so we have chick starter grower available, we also have a layer available, and then a broiler feed available, and we have that available in conventional and organic. Uh, we also have a poultry pro mineral um, that would be for uh, more of a large um, scale or somebody who has a lot of chickens and they want to mix their own feed, but we do have that option available as well. Um, and you can, you know, call in, stop in, or order online. Great. So I think that's all the questions we have. Um, do we um, want to talk about um, how to call in, anything, give the number, websites. Um, the meeting's going to be recorded, so we will be sending that out as well, the link to that. Um, but maybe, I don't know, Alex, if you want to give the website and phone number. Yeah, so you can go to crystalcreeknatural.com. Um, there's a lot of information on there. Um, we have a lot of articles and resources. Um, you can email us at info at crystalcreeknatural.com with any questions, or you can call in. Our number is 1-888-376-6777. Uh, you can also stop in if you'd like to. So we're open Monday through Friday, 8 to 4. Great. Okay. I don't know. Dr. Ryan, has anything else? Yeah, I just want to close by saying thanks to everybody who's attended. And uh, again, if you... If this was just so much fun, you want to watch it again, we're going to have it recorded so you can you can watch it as many times as you want. Um, but yeah, I think I think that's it. And uh, if you have any further questions, we're easy to get a hold of. Like Alex said, you can stop by our office. We're at 1600 Groundhouse Road on the north end of Spooner or give us a call and uh, or give us an email and we'll take care of your questions as they come up. Just want to say thanks, everybody, for coming.